Well, welcome back to Scripture and Science. We're in session nine. Now, in this session, we're going to transition a little bit to our next scientific discipline. We're going to talk about biochemistry and evolution. And of course, evolution has been a hot button part of the religion and science debate for a long time now. And so we're going to start by just discussing a little bit about modern biochemistry and how the theory of evolution uh, is supported and some of the evidence for it. And I think that there has to be a big caveat that I start with here, which is I have never formally studied biology or chemistry at the college or above level. I did it at the high school level, but not at the college level. So um, I have observed the evidence for the Big Bang in my undergrad curriculum as a physicist and have, because of that, I have certain um, ways of looking at the world because I've seen the evidence, I've, I've, I've worked with the evidence, I've seen how it gets practically applied. So my perspective on the Big Bang is different than many people's because I've looked at the evidence myself and I feel strongly about that evidence. So if, if you're a Christian, who believes like, for example, Dr. Francis Collins, strongly in evolution, then I get that. I understand that. That's not my bias. That's not my perspective. I come to my study of evolution as a physicist, not as a biologist, not as a chemist, not as someone who has interacted with this evidence day after day for the course of years. And so that is my big caveat here, that I am a physicist presenting about evolution. <laughs> it's a little backwards, maybe, but that's the best we've got. So today we're talking about biochemistry and evolution. And I want to start with some common misconceptions with evolution. Then we're going to talk about a general framework for evolution. We're going to try to put ourselves in the mind of someone who believes in the theory of evolution. What does that look like? And then we're going to discuss quite a bit about modern evolutionary theory. And in a future session, actually in multiple future sessions, we're going to talk about pushback to the theory of evolution. So don't worry, we will get there. We will absolutely get there. But before we get into the common misconceptions, I want to, I want to ground that discussion about common misconceptions uh, with this. Christians should want to engage in discussions with outsiders in a way that understands the view of that outsider. So when we go in and talk to someone who is an atheist or agnostic and they have a belief in evolution, as Christians, we don't want to come to that conversation with misconceptions. We don't want to come to that conversation with something that comes out of our mouth and is going to make us sound like we don't understand where that person's coming from from the very beginning. Now we can, and we are going to make mistakes, and that's not what I'm trying to say. If you get there and you say something that's a misconception, then please be open to that other person explaining what they actually believe and reframing that conversation for you. But I'm trying to give at least some context here for some common misconceptions so that we can avoid some of that. So that when we have these dialogues on religion and science, we can do it in a way that honors both sides, that, that, that shows that we can speak the language. So it's vital that we learn to do this when we engage with outsiders. So with that in hand, I want to start with common misconceptions with evolution. This is one I've heard a lot. It's just a theory. It's just a theory. We talked a little bit about the pejorative use of the word theory when we talked about gap theory. And the truth is, especially when we talk about science, is that a theory is a big deal. So often opponents of evolution will say, it's a theory. They'll say that pejoratively. But the point is, evolution does account for much of the scientific evidence and has made many successful predictions that we can, that we can see. So saying it's just a theory is not helpful. This is a quote from Richard Dawkins' book on evolution called The Greatest Show on Earth. He says that the definition of theory is a scheme or system of ideas or statements held as an explanation or account of a group of facts or phenomena, 
a hypothesis that has been confirmed or established by observation or experiment, and is propounded or accepted as accounting for the known facts. A statement of what are held to be the general laws, principles, or causes of something known or observed. So theories are a big deal. <laughs> so if we just say, hey, it's just a theory, that's, that's using the colloquial usage of the word theory. It's not using the scientific usage of the word theory. And you're going to turn people off uh, outside the faith by saying stuff like that. Misconception number two is, is a big one, too. Um, some people believe that evolution attempts to explain how life began. So often opponents of evolution will knock at that beginning of life problem, which is a big problem. The beginning of life issue is a big issue in modern science. We just don't know, really. We don't have a concrete theory as to how life began. So uh, opponents of evolution will attack by going in that way. But the problem is the theory of evolution is not about the beginning of life. It doesn't even attempt to account for it. The beginning of life theory is called abiogenesis. Abiogenesis, that's the theory about the beginning of life. Evolution begins when you have a viable living thing. We might say, well, that's, that's a big leap. It is, but that's where that theory begins. It begins with life. It does not begin with time before life and try to explain that time. It's important for us to understand that. Here's another one. Evolution says that humans evolved from apes. That is not what the theory of evolution says. Uh, this is a vast oversimplification of the theory. What evolution teaches is that all life came evolved from a single organism. So you have life, you have a single organism, and that from that single organism, over time, the tree of life spreads out. And we end up with all these different organisms. So what we can say about this is that apes and humans share an ancestor, that the modern chimpanzee, the modern gorilla, and the modern human, that we all share a common ancestor. But we did not evolve. The theory does not say that we evolved from gorillas. That's not what the theory says. So we've got to, be, we've got to use their terms. We've got to understand where they're coming from. Here's a little bit more subtle one. Uh, misconception number four is, Evolution is a progression from simpler organisms to more complex organisms. This is a little bit of an oversimplification of the theory as well. What an evolutionist would say is that no particular animal alive is more advanced than any other prior animal in history. I think that's a very interesting claim to make, and we can discuss whether we think that that's true or not. Um, I think it's an interesting, interesting conversation to have. But according to evolutionary theory, it doesn't go from less advanced to more advanced. Now, they'll, what they'll say is current animals are simply better suited to survive than their ancestors. So, so every animal as it stands right now is just better suited than prior versions along the tree of life. They wouldn't say they're more advanced. Now certainly in a global sense, going from one single-celled organism to the vast amount of life that we see today, there has been advancement, and they will understand it from a macro perspective that there's advancement. What I'm talking about is they will not point to a specific species and say that that species is more advanced than any other species ever. So those are four misconceptions about evolution, and hopefully that helps us in our conversations about evolution as we discuss it in this session and also with conversations with people outside the faith. I want to talk now about a general framework of evolution. And so what we're going to do is go through what I would call an extended thought experiment. And the goal of this thought experiment is not for me to convince you that evolution is true or anything like that. I'm trying to help us all think like an evolutionist might think. And again, I'm coming to this from an, as an outsider, having not studied evolution formally. I'm a physicist by training. So... This example or this thought experiment, there may be people who come, out, come after, after me and say, well, his example is a little weird here, a little weird there, or whatever. It's a thought experiment. I'm doing my best here. <laughs> so let's, let's just imagine for the moment that millions of years ago, there is an animal named Tom. It's a mammal. We're going to name him Tom. So at one point, there is just one population of Toms. They, they all exist together. 
and genetic information is passing freely between them. Now let's say that um, something drastic happens, like a great tectonic event happens and they get split. But like, let's say there's a mountain in between them now. Um, and so you've got one population on one side of the mountain, you've got another population of toms on the other side of the mountain. Now, in the immediate time frame, when that split happens, that genetic information stops getting shared between the two populations. So now they're isolated. You've got one population of toms over here, you've got one population of toms over here, there's no um, <clears throat> interrelationship between them. Now, let's imagine that on one side of the mountain, there's more rain. On the other side of the mountain, there's less rain, there's more heat. So over time, what's gonna happen is there are gonna be slight changes. There's gonna be different predators on each side of the mountain. There's gonna be different prey on each side of the mountain. There's gonna be different conditions, uh, different amounts of, of heat. So you might, the toms on the colder side might need more fur. The toms on the hotter side might need less fur. That might be more advantageous, okay? So over time, you can think about how this might develop. Now, since the populations have been split, there's no sharing of genetic information anymore. Now, random mutations take place. These are not guided. So it's not like, you know, the toms think to themselves, hey, we need shorter fur, we need longer fur, something like that. What happens is randomly, a child, a child tom gets born with shorter hair in the hotter side. Well, that child would be more likely to survive than a longer haired tom. So over time, you can see that these, that the ones that are more favorable, the mutations that are more favorable for survivability are more likely probabilistically to be passed on to subsequent generations. So over time, you have these small changes that get accumulated. So since the environments are different, the random mutations that lead to quote unquote better alternatives are different. They're just different. On one side of the mountain, one thing may be advantageous. On another side of the mountain, another thing might be advantageous. Could be snout shape or teeth size. Could be hair length, whatever the case might be. There could be a number of different possibilities. The point is these mutations, according to the theory of evolution, happen randomly, some of them are more likely to produce uh, better results in that specific habitat. And since those two habitats are different, you're gonna have different random mutations over time that get stored up in that genetic uh, group of individuals. So over time, these mutations eventually, according to the theory of evolution, will build up into noticeable differences. You could look at the population on one side of the mountain and say, hey, the colder side of the mountain, they've got longer hair. The, other, the higher side of the mountain, they've got shorter hair. Hey, this one's got a longer snout because they're digging into this type of uh, uh, situation to get these types of insects or whatever. And on this side, they've got wider snouts because they're dealing with this type of fruit or this type of whatever. You know, again, the possibilities are almost endless for, a, for an evolutionist, okay, on what could happen over time. But eventually, according to the theory of evolution, you're gonna have two species emerge, and we can call them Tom A and Tom B. And so that's where that tree of life splits at that juncture, and you've got two different populations, and now you eventually get two different species. And over time, there could be further splitting, depending on what happens, or there could just be further progression, progression, I'm putting in air quotes, uh, based on how the environment changes, how the predators and prey changes, how all those things change over time. If there are changes to those things, then eventually further development could take place. So I hope that thought experiment was helpful for you in understanding how an evolutionist approaches the evidence and how they think about the evidence um, and that can help you be in a sort of an evolutionary framework or a way of thinking. So that's, that's my general framework of evolution. Now, for the rest of this session, I'd like to talk about um, the scientific evidence for evolution. Why do people believe in this theory? Uh, why is it the currently accepted uh, macro biochemical uh, way of viewing life? And so let's start with the predictions of evolution. What successful predictions has evolution made? 
The first one is scientists have demonstrated that DNA is more advanced as life is more advanced. So, for example, human DNA is like 96% similar to chimpanzee DNA. What's also interesting is the number of protein coding genes is roughly the same for all animals and plants. So you have essentially the same building blocks for every living creature. And yet how they get used in, in these different creatures is, is slightly different. And this is what Francis Collins says. And, and before I give his quote here, I've mentioned Francis Collins before. He wrote the book, The Language of God. He is a Christian scientist with uh, impeccable credentials. And I wanted to give you a little bit more about his background. He grew up as an agnostic and he did not grow up in a faith-based home. When he went to college and he studied chemistry and eventually got a doctor in physical, doctorate in physical chemistry, he, for a period of time, was an atheist, an avowed atheist. He went back to medical school, became a medical doctor as well. So he has a PhD and an MD. And it was during his time as a medical doctor, he saw people of faith, how they approached the medical issues that they were dealing with, and it led him to open up an investigation. And now he's been a committed Christian for a number of years. And his book, The Language of God, is how he explains the connection between scripture and science. So anyway, Francis Collins is a very interesting person to talk about when we talk about evolution because he is absolutely committed to evolution as a theory. He's also absolutely committed to Christianity. And so he's an example of how we can walk the fine line between those two things if we think that that's the way to go. This is what Francis Collins says about the building blocks being the same. He says, our complexity must arise not from the number of separate instruction packets, but from the way they are utilized. And he thinks evolution is the mechanism that explains how those different, uh, the same instruction packets get utilized in different ways by different species. I wanted to talk, I've mentioned briefly this idea of the tree of life. The concept of the tree of life is another important prediction of evolution. What we should see is we should see these intermediate species in the fossil record and also in the genetic record as we study the world around us. Here is a physical representation of the tree of life. You have initial species at the bottom, A through L, and over time you can see branching off of various species. And so this is how we expect things to look. In the fossil record, we should expect to see fossils like this. In the genetic record, we should see genetics like this. And there is support for this tree of life in the fossil record. For example, the transition between fish and amphibians. According to evolutionary theory, everything began in the, in the water, eventually transitioned to land. And the way that they, the uh, animals did that is from fish uh, to amphibians. So we should be able to find fish that have legs or like a way to walk and breathe oxygen outside of a water environment. And sure enough, we believe we can find them in the fossil record. We've found uh, several life forms that seem to fit that requirement. In modern times, genetic sequencing has uh, greatly advanced evolutionary theory and has confirmed many of scientific, uh, scientists' predictions about evolution. There are a few notable surprises. And I want to mention one of them specifically. Uh, you can research this more on your own, but uh, you would think, or you know, scientists thought that um, that mammals evolved from like water mammals. That water mammals, you know, that sort of the evolution happened in the water, you know, and then you know evolution happened on land, sort of separately. But what they actually can see in the genetic account is that water mammals, like dolphins and whales, actually evolved from earlier land mammals. So what that means is you had fish to amphibians, then you had reptiles, you have birds, then you have mammals. And once you get to land mammals, at some point, some of these land mammals decide, hey, it's time to head back into the water. And they go back to the water. And that's how you get dolphins and whales and things like that. And that's not what they're expecting. Um, so, so this has been a challenge. Genetic sequencing has challenged some of evolution's earlier ideas. It doesn't necessarily disconfirm the theory of evolution, but it does make scientists refine how they view evolution as a theory and, and how, how it all works. This is what uh, Francis Collins says about uh, DNA sequences and, and the tree of life and uh, the fossil record. He says, at the level of the genome as a whole, a computer can construct a tree of life based solely upon the similarities of the DNA sequences of multiple organisms. 
Bear in mind that this analysis does not utilize any information from the fossil record or from anatomical observations of current life forms. Yet, its similarity to conclusions drawn from studies of comparative anatomy is striking. So what he's saying is, if you look just at the genetic information, and then you look at the fossil record, you can overlay those two and you get pretty striking similarities. So there's pretty good uh, evidence that you know, he thinks evolution is true. Now, what about uh, microevolution? That's another successful prediction of evolution. Lovers of dogs understand this very well. Breeders and agricultural experts have demonstrated microevolution countless times. There's all sorts of new dog breeds coming up all the time. This is what we'd call microevolution. They select specific traits, they breed based on specific traits, and over generations you can see the dogs change shape, for example, uh, or their hair changing, uh, like long hair to short hair, things like that. You also have the example of hybrid crops, all sorts of genetically modified crops. Um, so we, we've seen uh, microevolution demonstrated countless times. Now, detractors of evolution sometimes say that microevolution is possible, but macroevolution is not. Um, evolutionary scientists like Francis Collins will say that that distinction is an artificial or arbitrary one. That if you believe that microevolution can take place, if you believe in the mechanism, if you see the results, um, then macroevolution is also true. So that's what Francis Collins will say. Again, you have to decide what you believe. Another uh, successful prediction of evolution is the so-called so so accumulation of junk DNA. Now, junk, junk DNA is a little bit of a controversial term uh, because we don't know enough about the genome to say whether something is really junk or not. We can see at times uh, with certain um, illnesses where certain parts of the genetic code seem to have been deleted or modified uh, and certain things like that. And so we can see some things with some certainty but the idea of junk, junk DNA is still a little bit controversial. But what Darwin's theory predicts is that mutations that do not affect function, which is located in junk DNA, will accumulate slowly over time. Um, and it turns out we do. We see this. We see this. And we also see silent differences in the genetic code, where in one part uh, the gene's expressed, and in another part the gene, in another later form, the gene's not expressed. Now, I think that leads us to the most important question, which is, what about man? What about man? Does, does evolution necessarily show that humans evolved? Well, according to Richard Dawkins, the answer is yes. And Richard Dawkins demonstrates that he thinks the fossil record is full of what we would call missing links. That the fossil record is full and shows that a complete picture of what human development looked like over time. That evolution can handle how humans got here. Perhaps even more powerfully, Francis Collins gives evidence for human evolution from genetics. And we're going to explore that evidence in the re remaining part of this session. Because I, you know, we can look at Richard Dawkins, and I think Richard Dawkins says some interesting things. But Richard Dawkins is an atheist, and he has a bone to pick with Christianity specifically. And so... I understand that he may not be as trustworthy of a source when it comes to the relationship between scripture and science. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to focus in on why does Francis Collins, who grew up agnostic, who later became an atheist and eventually converted to Christianity, why does he still believe that humans evolved? So what is Francis Collins' best piece of evidence? We're going to tackle this by answering two basic questions. What happens when we compare the human genome to other animals' genomes? And what about genes that appear to be non-functional in humans, but functional in multiple other species? So fact number one, comparing human and mouse genomes. The first thing that conf roughly confirms evolution is that the overall size of the genome is roughly the same. And the inventory of protein encoding genes is remarkably similar. So again, we compare the human and the mouse, and we see the size of genomes the same. Inventory of protein coding genes is remarkably similar. That this is part of what leads evolutionists to believe that, that man evolved. Also interesting is that the order of genes is generally the same over substantial stretches of DNA. 
and it includes the existence of similar AREs. And AREs are ancient repetitive elements. You might be asking yourself, what's an ARE? Francis Collins says, when one aligns the sections of the human and mouse genomes anchored by the appearance of gene counterparts that occur in the same order, one can usually also identify AREs in approximately the same location in these two genomes. The process of transposition often damages the jumping gene. He's talking about genes that jump through different parts of different genomes. There are AREs throughout the human and mouse genomes that were truncated when they landed, removing any possibility of their functioning. In many instances, one can identify a decapitated and utterly defunct ARE in parallel positions in the human and mouse genome. So what he's saying is if you look at the human and the mouse genome and you zoom in, you can find these spots that are non-functional in both humans and mice, but they're in parallel positions. They're in the same spot. So the question is, if there was a designer, why would he include these defunct sections in parallel positions? For Francis Collins, that doesn't make sense. If we were all designed you know, out of nothing, if humans were just ex nihilo, created out of nothing, why would we see this? We would expect to see a human genome that was somewhat distinct from a mouse genome. That's Francis Collins' perspective on it. Here's another piece of evidence comparing human and chimpanzee chromosomal fusion. He says in the language of God, page 138, recently it has become possible to look at the precise location where this proposed chromosomal fusion must have happened, but they are found right where evolution would have predicted in the middle of our second fused chromosome. So what he's saying here is there are these predictions about where this chromosomal fusion took place and they happen right where evolution would have predicted, exactly at the right spot in the genome. So you know, he says this points really strongly to the fact that humans and chimpanzees share a prior ancestor. Here are two more items here in terms of comparing human and chimpanzee. Now we're talking about genetic function. There is a specific uh, gene called Caspase 12, and it's a functional gene in chimpanzees. It's also functional in many other mammals, including mice, okay, this specific gene. The human version of this gene is found in the identical location as the chimp version, but it lacks the function. And so again, what Francis Collins thinks when he looks at this evidence is, why would this exist in the human genome if it's not working anymore? And it's in the same exact spot as the chimpanzee one that still works. And it's still, and, and other animals have this gene and it also works in, in their genomes. He thinks this makes sense in light of evolution. It doesn't necessarily make uh, sense in light of um, man being created uniquely genetically. He's talking about genetic evidence for unique specific creation of humans. So I think that these are interesting uh, pieces of evidence. And I think that they're worthy of our consideration. But I don't think that evolution necessarily covers all the hurdles either. There's lots of hurdles that evolution has to jump. And what we talked about earlier is every scientific theory has open questions. Evolution has many open questions. And we're going to talk about several of them in a future session. So at the end of the day, that's a lot of evidence for evolution. There's much more out there. I highly recommend The Language of God by Francis Collins if you want a Christian perspective on the evidence for evolution, if you want a more well-rounded, um, non-theistic view or atheistic view, then Richard Dawkins' The Greatest Show on Earth is very comprehensive. So if you want to learn more about evolution, that's, what I, that's where I'd point you to. But at the end of the day, we all have to make decisions about how we view the scientific evidence, how much weight we give it, and how we think it can fit with scripture uh, one way or another. And so in, in a future session, that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about how can we relate these ideas together with Genesis 1 and the different ways of Genesis 1 that we've looked at in this class to this point. So that's just a little bit about evolution from the perspective of a physicist. So take that for what it may be. Thank you.